Um, guys, just really glad that you're here with us tonight um, as we kick off this message series through First John. As you turn in your Bibles to First John, let me kind of set the stage for us by talking about something that happened in 1995. Glafira Rosales walked into uh, an art gallery, Nedler's Art Gallery in New York back in 1995, carrying underneath her arm um, a painting by Mark Rothko that was valued at several million dollars. And she said, hey, I got good news. Not only are we going to be liquidating this particular piece, not only are we going to be putting this particular piece up for sale, but I've got a treasure trove of other masterpieces that I'm going to be helping Mr. X, just some you know, mysterious guy from Mexico n- named Mr. X, I'm going to be helping him liquidate his, his treasure trove of priceless art. And so for the next 15 years, she would walk in in the door with art that had the names of the masters plastered on the bottom left-hand corner on the back, you know, from far-flung parts of the world by the masters. And she would walk out of the same door with cash, lots of cash, 81 million in cash to be exact. Now, if you haven't seen the Netflix special on it, I haven't, but I just did some research on it. There's actually, right now on Netflix, you can watch about this. Obviously, all of the priceless masterpieces were nothing but fakes. They were forgeries. They were phonies. Completely valueless. They weren't painted by the masters over centuries around the world. They were done by a Chinese immigrant named Shea Pen Quinn, out of his apartment in New York. And the guy was talented. He would do his painting, and then he would take tea, probably sweet tea. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. He would take tea and or dirt out of his vacuum cleaner bag and apply it to the painting to age it, make it look all the more real. After 15 years... Thousands of art connoisseurs, several dozen artists had their names tainted, and one gallery after 165 years was put out of business because of this woman's scam and scheme. But that's what happens when you deal with fakes. Everybody gets cheated. Everybody loses out. There was an old preacher 2,000 years ago, when he looked out across the spiritual landscape, he was facing a similar predicament. As he, as he surveyed what was around him there in his part of the world, he saw false messiah after false messiah after false messiah and no shortage of false prophets willing to peddle those false messiahs. And so he says, I've, that's it. I've had it. We're done. And the old man the old preacher, grabbed a pen and a roll of papyrus and he put his pen to paper and he wrote down some words. Across history and forevermore into eternity, those words are going down as First John. Now, John wrote an interesting book. It's a beautiful book, but before we get into it, let's talk about who John is. Which John are we talking about? Because if you're a, a serious student of the New Testament, you probably know that there wasn't just one or two Johns. It's kind of like David Smith's. There was a lot of them, okay? For, for example, did you know that Peter's dad's name was John? Not that John. Did you know that Mark, the guy that we just finished studying, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Mark, his first name? was John, John Mark. We ain't talking about that John. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, one of the most electric people in the entire New Testament. Not talking about that John. We need to hone our focus in on John, the brother of James, the son of thunder, the beloved disciple of Jesus. It's a heck of a business card, isn't it? (laughs) Like, who are you? I'm John the brother of James, the son of thunder, the guy that Jesus said beloved to. So that's the John we're talking about. And when the story opens on John's life, at least our window to it, John's a young man. 
He's a fisherman. He works for his dad. And then this unknown preacher comes meandering through Galilee and utters a two-word invitation to this man, to this probably honestly, I know, I know we're all watching the chosen and everything, and they're all grown. Be, I'm just being honest with you. I think most of these disciples were teenagers to college age when Jesus met them. I'm just gonna put that out there, okay? I'm gonna put that out there. He's a young man. Jesus says, Follow me, and John followed him. Left his dad and the nets in the boat and followed Jesus wherever he went. And let me tell you something, John saw it all. John saw it all. John went with Jesus wherever he went. John saw, John heard, John touched, he tasted, he smelled, just what Eileen was leading us to a moment ago. Everything that Jesus did, John was witness to it because John was part of the inner circle of Jesus. Yeah, he, he had the 12 disciples and he had, you know, a, a couple dozen more beyond that, you know, part of his group that would travel with him. But when it came right down to it, the only three that got a chance to go with Jesus where he went, John was one of them. John saw things that Matthew didn't see. John saw things that, that his brother, you know, that, that, that uh, Mary didn't see, or Thomas or Bartholomew didn't see, or the other Mary, or the other, other Mary. There was a lot of Marys, too. John was there. John was part of the inner circle. He saw it all. He saw it all. He saw Jesus die on a cross, perhaps maybe the only disciple, perhaps maybe the only disciple to see Jesus die on the cross, and then he saw Jesus alive again. And that moment, that day, marked that man, changed him forever. John began to teach. He began to pray like he had never prayed before. He began to heal. He, he, he began to argue and, and disagree with and share Jesus. Not argue like, you know, nasty argument, just giving a defense of who Jesus was. He traveled. He proclaimed the gospel. He did all these things, and he got old, really old. I mean super old. Like when John writes 1 John, we ain't talking about young John anymore. We, we ain't talking about, you know, the I outran Peter to the tomb of Jesus John, okay? We're talking about old man John. In fact, we really don't even call him John. He goes by a nickname, the elder. I know that may sound disrespectful, but but people called John the Elder because, well, John called himself the Elder. If you don't believe, you got your Bibles on your laps? Come on, people. Flip over real quick. Flip two pages over to the first line of 2 John, the first line of 3 John. What you see? What you see? The Elder to who? To the elect lady. Woo! Y'all need to look up who that is. And then later in first John, 3 John, the elect, the Elder to who? Gaius. So John calls himself the elder. In fact, when John would preach, this is the story that's passed down from John's disciple Polycarp to Josephus and throughout my seminary professors, and that's how I got the story. But um, that John was so old when he was writing 1 John, when he was writing the Gospel of John, that he would, he had his little walker with the tennis balls, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, he was so old, before he had wheelchairs and walkers, they would carry the old guy. A couple of dudes would come in and carry this frail old man. They would notify all the city of Ephesus, yo, the elder's going to be here. Pass the word. Skip. Tell it around. Hey, Chris, let somebody know. The elder's coming to town. Be at church Sunday night, okay? And then the whole group would show up, and they would Bring the elder in, John the elder. And they set him up front on the stool, and the place would get real quiet. And he would say, Little children, love one another. And that was it. That was the whole sermon. <laughs> That's all, the whole sermon. Little children, Love one another. Now, I know what some of y'all are thinking. Right now, right now, some of y'all are thinking, now, hold on a second, Pastor David, if, if Johnny Boy can do it in 10 seconds or less, come on, Skip, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. 
Why can't you short it down some? I'll tell you why. Because I walked in here on my own two legs tonight. And until y'all carry me in, okay, I'm going to preach as long as I want to. I'm just letting you know. Don't anybody get any ideas, all right? So there you go. So interestingly enough, at one of these occasions where the elder has preached his fine sermon, little children love one another, one of the dudes that had carried it in, one of the dudes that had been responsible for, you know, putting up the posters, one of the guys who was responsible for bringing in the crowd or turning on the lights, whatever, he goes, he goes, Brother John, he says, why, why is that all you say? Like he issues a complaint to, to John, which that tells you everything you need to know about Christians right there, okay? We will complain about a long sermon, we will complain about a short sermon, okay? But he says, why? Why is that all you say? Why don't you say more? Like, dude, we got the whole city turned out to hear you. You just come up and say, little children love one another. Why don't you say more? And the old man says, because if that's all they do, that will be enough. Now, John's sermons might have been one line. His preaching might have been on one line. But when we get to his letter that we're about to read, oh, we're going to like loop the loop, barrel roll, scissor, I mean the whole thing, okay? He's going to touch, it's like John's got ADHD or something, okay? Just stick with me on this, right? We're going to do the whole thing tonight, but but just whoo, like if you've ever read First John, all five chapters, like a page and a half, um, you know, like this brother's like the, he's like the squirrel, you know, uh, on, on sugar, you know. Um, so, so yeah, that's what John's doing. But his letter, when he wrote it, there were two things going on that we need to talk about. Two things were a part of the Christian's reality back 2,000 years ago that we, well, we have in some regards. Let, let me just spit them out to you. Here we go. The first one was this, persecution. Persecution. They were hunting Christians, and I mean that in the most literal sense. Okay, first of all, you got the Jews. Love me some Jews, but listen, they don't like us back then. Okay, once they realized that we weren't going to get off this Jesus guy, they washed their hands of us and said, Go get them, Rome. And Rome did. But before we get to Rome, the Jews says, They ain't us. They ain't from us. We don't believe the same thing. Have at them. Okay, and Rome steps in. Rome would use their army, they would use their empire, they would use whatever they had to come in and squash churches, arrest leaders, they would seize properties, homes, they would take away your license to do business, okay? That's what the emperors would do. You don't flex on the emperor, the emperor's gonna get you, okay? And, and there was a lot that went on, but, but I, I would say this, like, they would take, the Roman Empire would take Christians and, and like, throw them into gladiatorial events to use them as fodder for the fights, okay? They would take Christians and put them into uh, other arenas against wild animals and just entertain the crowds by watching even children being mauled by these wild animals. But Nero, Emperor Nero, who reigned for about three years because he just is crazy, um, he, he kind of really took the bar to the next level. Sorry if I can just be graphic with you for just a moment. I'll apologize in advance. Emperor Nero would take Christians, he would dip them in oil, and he would put them in iron cages and set them on fire to light his gardens and his courtyards at night. When I tell you that we were hunted and hated, that's exactly what I mean. So I love you, but when somebody flacks at you on Facebook or they walk away giggling because you love Jesus, it's going to be all right. Okay? Okay? Number two, beyond the persecution. That wasn't what made John wring his hands. That wasn't what kept him awake at night. Number two, it was heresy. And there were lots of, by the way, heresy. Heresy is a really spiritual word that means false teaching. Like, this ain't right. This ain't the truth. It sounds like the truth. It's got a lot of truth mixed in, but it's got a, lot, it's got a little bit of lie mixed in there too. And Jesus didn't say, I am the way and most of the truth and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. So John faced a lot of different heresies, but the one that we're going to center on here, you read about it this week in your Bible studies, right? Gnosticism. That's not how you pronounce it. The G's silent. It's Gnosticism. And we translate that word as knowledge. What we should translate it as is knucklehead, 
Martin, okay? Because that's what these guys were. Let me tell you, they, there were like as many different flavors of Gnostics as there you know, are whatever, fragments of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. But, but when it gets down to it, like the Gnostics, they all agreed on two things. Number one, that salvation, like how God loves us and how God saves us, well... Not the average regular Joe can like have access to that knowledge because it's special. It's, it's a secret. It's a mysterious kind of knowledge. Want to guess who had that knowledge? They did. Number two, this is going to sound weird. going to take you back to sixth grade science class. Number two, they believe that all matter, matter was evil. I, right, exactly. That's, what, that's the face I'm making, okay? So like the microphone, made out of matter, it's evil. My, um, my, my Bible, your Bible, man out of matter, it's evil. The columns here, the floor, the ceiling, the lights, all of us made out of matter, it's evil. Watch this. My earlobes, made out of matter. My lungs, my brain, made out of matter. So the Gnostics would say, that's evil. Pause this for a second. Let's have a little Bible study. Y'all ready? I'm made out of matter and therefore evil, but it was somebody else, slightly more important than me, who was also made out of matter. His name was Jesus. Because Jesus was made out of matter, the Gnostics taught, he must be evil, right? Well, now all the Gnostics got together like, well, dude, this ain't gonna sell nothing. I mean, we can't peddle no Jesus as evil. We gotta clean this guy up. I mean, ain't nobody gonna come. Like, hey, come to our church. Our God's super evil. Like, that's just not gonna get anybody. So, no, we gotta change this. And so they got all their thinking together. They put their heads together. And they came up with a solution that's going to put them on a collision course with an almost 100-year-old preacher. And this is what they said. All right, here's what we're gonna roll out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus looked real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sounded real. And, and yeah, he, he even like ate food, which, which sounds like what a real guy would do. But he wasn't really real. What he was was a, a phantom. He was a ghost. He was an image. He was a, a hologram, if you will. You could see him, but you couldn't touch him. Okay, that's, that's how we're going to sell. That's what we're going to come over. So there you go. There you go. That's how we're going to sell Jesus. That our Jesus was not really real. Our Jesus was just an image. Bible study continues. What's wrong with that? Help me out, church. What's wrong with that? Tell me how this is really bad news if they're right. He wasn't crucified. Let's chase it down. That's right, Daniel. If Jesus is just an image, he ain't got flesh and blood. If he ain't got flesh and blood, he can't die and bleed on the cross. And if he can't bleed on the cross, his blood can't be shed. And if his blood can't be shed, according to the book of Hebrews, there can be no forgiveness of sin. We've got a problem here. He's not fully human. And probably not even fully God. Again, they had many, many fractions. And so John takes up his pen and his paper, and he's going to absolutely body slam the Gnostics. I would love to see the old man get in the cage with these guys. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read God's word so that this sermon can finally begin. <clears throat> Who's ordering the pizzas tonight? All right, here we go. John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and made manifest to us. He appeared to us is what John's saying. He, be, he was real. He was always real. And then he showed up on our front doorstep, right? Verse 3, that which we have seen, he repeats himself. And that which we have heard, we proclaim also to you that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. All right. I know that's a little clunky and Again, John, Sam likes John. Um, I'm more of in the Peter camp, okay? And I'm just going to tell you, like, John, he's just going to circle around. I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, but, like, like you're not going to learn anything in 1 John. I don't mean to throw any shade on God's word, but, like, John's going to tell you, hey, love God. Okay. Hey, love others. Okay. Hey, obey God. Okay. Hey, 
hey, don't be following no idols. Okay. Hey, obey God. Okay, are we circling back around? That's First John, okay? Get used to it. So if you think I'm repeating myself for the next 10 weeks, it's because John's repeating himself, and I'm going to say what John said, because what John said is what the Holy Spirit said, amen? Okay, okay. So John's, I, 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 I'm going to look at verse 3. I think we're going to just put up verse 3 here. This is all we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. I think that this is what, this is how, if I had to sum this up, I'd say this. We're preaching the real Jesus to you. I'll tell you why we're preaching the real Jesus to you, because I know the real Jesus. And if you will put faith in him, it's going to make family out of us. All right, so let's break that down for just a few moments. John says, I'm going to preach to you the real Jesus because I know him, okay? I have heard him. I have seen him. I have touched him. Guys, I don't know. I don't know if you know your word or not. But imagine what John, the old man, is reflecting on and what he's thinking about when he says, oh, I heard his voice. You know what I'm saying, MJ? Like, I was there when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I was standing right there. Like, he even spit on me because I was in the splash zone when he says, you know, I am the vine and you are the branches and you can do nothing apart from me. I'm the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in me, you're not even going to die. Like, John heard with his own ears Jesus say these things. He says, oh my gosh, I saw him. I saw him, I mean, I saw the color of his eyes, I saw the color of his hairs. I could tell you what his hands looked like. Let me tell you what I'm saying. He knelt down the night that we forsook him. And he washed our feet with his hands. He touched, he touched me. And I touched him. I heard what he said. I saw him. I was there when he said, outside the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus, come on out of there. And the dead man that we buried four days earlier come walking out alive. I saw that happen. But the thing that I saw the most I'll never forget is when he came out of the grave. Like you, don't, you don't think John went up to Jesus and hugged on some Jesus when he saw his Lord, his teacher, his rabbi, his friend, his, his miracle worker come out of the grave? Listen, I saw my mom and dad, my family, you know, just a few weeks ago. When they walked in church, I went and hugged on them, okay? It's good to touch them, good to feel them, right? I ain't ever seen any of them die, okay? So you know John was grabbing on to Jesus. I have seen him alive again. He's changed my life. And so all you Gnostics, all you people who, who kind of want to sort of believe in a little bit of Jesus or a lot of bit of Jesus, but not all Jesus, I've heard him, I've seen him, I've touched him. What you got? Nothing. And he blows up the heretics across these first four verses. Buckle up, buttercup, it's coming, okay? They, this is, the gloves come off in chapter one, right, Sam? Okay, this is, this is the nice chapter, okay? So let's just take a second, if it's okay, I want, to get, I want to get in the ring with John. Can I blow up some, some fake Jesuses out here today? Because, I mean, it ain't like we put away the fake Jesuses back in John's day. We got some fake Jesuses running around here today. Let me introduce three of them to you. Checklist Jesus. Y'all ever heard of Checklist Jesus? Checklist Jesus will tell you everything you got to do to save you. He will tell you, oh, you better go to church if you want to get saved. Or you better be baptized if you want to get saved. You better walk little old ladies across the street if you want to get saved. You better do good stuff if you want to get saved. You better not do bad stuff if you get saved. And he's telling us all that we got to do to save ourselves. And I'm going, um, excuse me, checklist Jesus, what do I need you for? I'm doing all the heavy lifting. And by the way, if I do good stuff, how much good stuff I got to do? Checklist Jesus. And if I do bad stuff, does that undo the good stuff that I do? Checklist Jesus. And if so, how much undoing does it do? Checklist Jesus is related to self-help Jesus. Self-help Jesus on his mama's side is related to be a, a better person Jesus. They're all charlatans. They're all fakes. You cannot, I love you, look at me, you cannot save yourself. You need the real Jesus to be saved. Checklist Jesus ain't going to get you there. Okay, let's go on to the second fake Jesus of the day, the health and wealth Jesus. Y'all know this one, right? 
We all heard of health and wealth, Jesus, right? I mean, he's the, he's the Jesus that all those preachers on TV wearing the Rolexes are talking about, right? And, and listen, I'm like most of the people in Joel Osteen's church. I like the sound of health and wealth, Jesus. <laughs> Y'all saw what I did there, right? I mean, just, just so we're clear. Okay. All right. Health and wealth, Jesus says, listen, God wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be rich. He doesn't want you to ever face cancer. He doesn't want you to ever face dementia. He doesn't want you to ever face COVID. He doesn't want you to ever face anything that's wrong with you. And so they point at, I don't know who, as their evidence. Because let me tell you about the real Jesus. He wasn't rich. In fact, everybody in this room, every child in this room is richer than the real Jesus. You know how I know that? Because every single one of y'all tonight going to go home and sleep underneath a roof. Jesus one time says that if you want to follow me, that's great, but just count the cost. Because listen, birds have nests and foxes have hole in the ground. The Son of Man, I don't even have a place to lay my head. You coming or not? Mm. So he wasn't rich. I don't know where you're getting this from. And in the health part, dude, they killed him on a cross. Health and wealth, Jesus, it doesn't line up with the biblical Jesus. Can we be done with this guy? Sorry. Listen, if anybody promises to pray for you, if you'll mail in a $1,000 check, come see me. I will pray for you for free, okay? I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. All right, go see Eileen. We do prayer requests. Prayer is free in the root church, okay? Third and final false Jesus we need to talk about. I'm going to read something to you. I wrote this up. I'm going to call this one social justice Jesus. He one of the most popular. This is the Jesus that's raging today. This is, I want to introduce him to you. Social justice Jesus will keep you up with the latest religious fads. Social justice Jesus will point out all the victims of society and condemn you for your various privileges. Social justice Jesus will lower standards and change definitions so that anyone can use whatever bathroom they want. Oh, yeah, we go in there. Social justice Jesus will accommodate any sexual preference because, well, who is he to judge? He ain't nobody to judge. But the real Jesus, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's going to return as the righteous judge. But we'll get to him in a minute. Social justice Jesus will fight for women's rights, even if it means 700,000 babies each and every year will lose their right to life. Social justice Jesus will keep you busy. Social justice Jesus will focus you on the temporary to blind you from the eternity so that you don't bother yourself with preaching the gospel because eternity doesn't really matter. It's all about today. It's all about now. It's all about the moment. Social justice Jesus is a hoax. And so... We can't be looking at any of those. John says, I knew him, I saw him, I heard him, I touched him. We've got to keep moving because I want to wrap up here in just a few seconds. Um, there's many more fake Jesus we could talk about, but John calls our attention to the real Jesus because if you want real faith, you got to have the real Jesus. And John says this, I'm writing this letter to you so that you'll have faith in the real Jesus. You'll have real faith in my real Jesus, the one I know, the one I touched, the one I heard, the one I looked at with my own eyeballs. And, and listen, we don't know who John wrote his letter to. Sorry, no Bible scholar can say that. We don't know what people group, we know what language he wrote it in, but, but he, he mailed it somewhere into the Roman Empire. Let me tell you who it might have read that letter. Certainly a Jewish person would have read that letter. Certainly a Roman person would have read that letter. How about a Cyrene? How about an Ethiopian? How about an Egyptian? How about an Arabian? How about an on and on and on and on that list goes. You can look at the list in Acts chapter 2, by the way. Lots of people called the Roman Empire home. Lots of different languages, lots of different nationalities, lots of different cultures and beliefs and practices. And John says, let me tell you about Jesus. He's real, you can have faith in him, and don't matter your skin color, don't matter your background, don't matter what you did or who you were, we can be in God's family together. We belong to a really big family, and there's room for at least one more. What you say. So let me ask you this question. Look at the screen. Three people up here. 
Take a look at them. I'm going to make it obvious. This is an easy question. Which one of them is most like you? MJ, what you think? Ain't none of them bald, but what you think? <laughs> I mean, I mean, look at him like, well, I don't wear paint on my face. <laughs> We're going to pray for you. <laughs> uh, I mean, you look at these guys, I mean, like, I don't know. You, you got to be, you got to be, but you had to pick one, though, Miss Judy. You got to pick one. You got to, come on. I mean, probably the lady in the middle, right? And she's kind of like most like, I mean, she's got the right smile. She's got the right clothes. She's got the right image. She's got the right amount of money. She probably drives the right car and lives in the right neighborhood. She's just got the right everything. Right? Hold on. Let me, let me tell you something about the guy on the end, this Maasai warrior. He doesn't know the name of our president. He's never seen an American. He doesn't speak English. He's never been inside of a building in his entire life, but he is a lover of Jesus Christ. Let me ask a question again. Who you got more in common with now? That guy. Let me tell you something. If you have a twin brother or a twin sister and they don't follow Jesus, you've got more in common with that guy on the other side of the world because that guy's relationship with you and with Jesus, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, that relationship is going to stretch into eternity. Okay? So John's saying, I'm preaching. Listen, if you'll pay attention for the next four and a half chapters, I'm preaching the real Jesus to you. And the reason I'm preaching the real Jesus to you is because I know the real Jesus. And if you'll put your faith in him, it's going to make family out of us. We're going to be in this together. You don't ever have to be alone. We can be in this together. And so, as I wrap up, let me just encourage you, like I always do. John saw Jesus hanging on a cross. He saw Jesus die. He had heard what Jesus said about he and his own mother, Mary, out there just outside the city gates of Jerusalem when he died. They saw where they were, put his dead body, and three days later, he saw Jesus raised back to life. He could not explain it. He could not understand it. All he could do is all you can do, and that's to believe it. So after Eileen comes forward here in just a few moments and reads us some analysis and keeps us on the same page. If you want to talk more about Jesus, if you want to put your faith in Jesus, if you're like, man, I've been following the wrong Jesus. I haven't even been given any Jesus any time. Man, come see me. Grab one of our leaders. Don't you dare leave here tonight without having time to talk about who Jesus is, what he did for you and for me, and how we can know because we've seen, we've heard, we've touched. That's the kind of faith that John wants us to have in Jesus. Let me pray for you.